subjects. Um, the seminar, as usual, is broadcast uh, over the web. Uh, we're using Wex software this time, so I hope everything works well. Um, uh, everyone to identify themselves so that our internet audience uh, can follow better uh, this session. My name is Human Noman, coordinator of WHO Press. Uh, expert speaker today is Dr. Sophie Harmon, uh, who's a senior lecturer in international public policy at Queen University in London. Um, she's uh, her background is in uh, international political economy, where and um, she's um, a graduate and postgraduate and doctorate of University of Manchester. Uh, she's written articles and a number of books uh, on this subject. Her last book uh, was published this year on global governance. Uh, she also spoke, uh, written on the World Bank HIV AIDS. Um, on other areas, including uh, international politics, um, for a number of um, uh, positions. Uh, she's the Dove undergraduate studies um, at uh, City University, and has been uh, well, she's a trustee uh, of the executive committee of the International Studies Association. So, oh, with that, I will ask uh, Sophie to. Presentation and then to be followed by three who staff will speak and then we'll open it up for questions here uh, in the audience here and anyone from the internet who wants to ask. So, Sophie, please. Well, thank you, Human, and thank you to Human and Stanjoy for inviting me here today for all of you to come and see me speak in your lunch hours. I very much appreciate it. As you can see, my, my uh, presentation today is on leadership in global health governance. Because I've actually begun working in with my colleagues from Rushton from the University of Sheffield. So it's quite hard to present on a subject that you are beginning to research on rather than the findings of a much wider research project. But it's draw on my previous work on global health governance and also the World Bank's role in global health governance. Hopefully I can tease out some of the themes in the presentation today. Leap is possibly a question that you are familiar with in your day working. It's whether someone's showing leadership in your sector, winning with WHO showing leadership in global health, or how you can develop yourself to become a future leader in global health. What we're going to find is that this term is banned around quite often, but with less sort of substance to what we need. What is good leadership when we see it? Is it the kind of management speak that we see? You know, you, like me, you travel from London to the Air Force, or you walk through the streets of Osaka and Zambia and on the floor of how to manage things better. Or be really critically engaged at this at a time that is a uh, need more leadership in global health. So today is outlined some of the kind of key reasons why we think we need leadership in global health. How to understand leadership and what this means, particularly in the case of global health. Before some preliminary findings that came from a workshop that I hosted at Aquinary in January, sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, the reason really depends on the way in which I intend to move forward on this. So I'm going to some ideas that you can clearly be critical of. So those that are good, I'll write those that are a bit iffy, maybe they'll put to the side. Um, and these are that leadership is temporal and spatial, and it depends on the context in which it is happening. So this is a global health history seminar. I'm not a historian, but I do follow the work of great historians like Sanjo. But we learn from history because different contexts may require different forms of leadership. Second, in terms of effective leadership in global health, it's the substance of that leadership, but the ability to communicate that leadership, which is something I'll come back to. And finally, that there is a current tension in leadership in global health between legitimate leadership and authority. Where institutions and actors have quite a lot of legitimacy, they lack authority, and vice versa, we have some sort of organizations that have the authority, but are somehow lacking in legitimacy. Mm -hmm. so, before I get to all of that, why is there this kind of need for leadership? What are the key challenges for leadership? 
One thing, we have seen an unprecedented proliferation of global health institutions over the last 10 to 15 years. Simply put, I probably wouldn't have a job if it wasn't the creation of these institutions. I come from an international relations background, I specialize in global health. So I finished my PhD, which initially looked at the World Bank's relationship with NGOs and aid policy. And I started to you know, want to go and get a job, and all the people interviewed me said, Can you teach global health politics? Yes, <laughs> and the reason is it's because of the proliferation of all these kinds of institutions. People will understand what these new institutions mean for international organization and global governance more broadly. Also, people are keen to understand this relationship between health and security. This transition is not only just new institutions, we also see the growth of non-state finance and influence. Now, of course, historians of health will always argue this has always been the case. But for me, I think we see an acceleration and an intensification of these kinds of actors. The challenge to state-based institutions. So decision-making often rests with those states, those delegates of states to international organizations. But what are the rise of the resurgence of private philanthropy? What about the mushrooming of civil society organizations? How do these challenge these state-centric models? The changing nature of health advocacy and inflation. Now, you could say that if there was a pandemic flu outbreak tomorrow, and obviously you would then run out of the room and try and sort this out instead of be listening to me, so that's good. Um, you would the WHO. The WHO would issue guidance to states, and in an ideal world, the media will pick up on this, and everyone will say, well, this is the WHO guideline, this is what I'm going to follow. But we also know that people might also take to Twitter or Facebook as well. The media is publishing these guidelines. But my friend's aunt said that she did this, and therefore I'm going to follow this kind of information. So in a way, we have an overabundance of information about health policy, which clusters those sort of voices and leaders that might be helpful in identifying those kind of communications that can impact upon positive health outcomes. The challenge is there's a reawakening of health and foreign policy. And we see this in many ways. We see this as a relationship between certain health issues being identified as security threats, such as AD and the whole frame of AD as a security threat. We can see it now with the targeting of health workers, as we saw with the recent deaths in Pakistan. So increasing interrelationships. And of course, the globalization of health policy. Now, ideas of how we approach health are not necessarily heterogeneous, but are increasingly homogenous. And with the space for alternatives within this. This, I'm all familiar with these kind of changes. You don't need someone like me to come and tell you them, so you know this. But what kind of challenges that this poses to do it? Well, of course, the overlapping mandate and purpose. So many institutions doing so many different but very similar things. How do you provide an overarching leadership role that brings together these kind of actors? Increasingly, we have agendas that fit the finance, not finance that fit the agendas. And many of you working in health systems find this a constant frustration. This needs to certain outcomes to have kind of performance indicators for certain health issues. Increasingly, it's driven by the finance. Third, is the delitization of global health. Now, what do you mean by this? Of course, health is a political theme. The way which health policy is approached is in a very technocratic, results orientated way. Show the data when we can do this. Show me the kind of technical solutions to some of these problems. Rather than having space for disagreement, contention, discussion. You may attend all these many, many meetings, but where is the open space in which these kinds of discussions can help? Do I need to stop moving around? Are we good? Okay. All right. And also, the verification of leaders that fit the mold. Now, obviously, with the exception of Margaret Anne, the predominance of male, white, Western, or Western educated leaders in global health. We see those characters, which I'll come to in a bit, what they tend to look like and who do they tend to be. There are these types of characters that fit the mold. And there's an absorption of dissenting voices from civil society. So you do thrive. Civil society movements, such as the People's Health Movement, are offering other visions of, you know, another world is possible with the kind of Global Health Watch report. But other civil society organisations 
options have become frankly intertwined with the market of health service delivery. Um, more involved in health service delivery than necessarily coming up with alternative ideas. There is often a contentious subject, so I'd be happy to explore more of this in the Q&A. But what's interesting to me is such changes and challenges have actually been met by this increasing rhetoric towards more leadership. So recently, I was doing some research before Christmas on performance financing, and I was in Zambia and Tanzania, and I was talking to World Bank officials. I've you know, been doing research in the World Bank for some time now, and you know, two years ago, they talked about country ownership. Five years ago, it was country ownership. Ten years ago, it was country ownership. Next is leadership. Less ownership is about leadership. For certain health reforms to succeed, you need to have certain types of leaders, which to me was very interesting. And in a sense, strong leadership is praised in health reform. An example that was constantly cited to me, Rwanda. Rwanda is an excellent model for health reform because it is leadership from the top all the way around. Now, of course, someone interested in international relations, I said, well, that's very interesting. How do you square this with Paul Kagame's uh, attention towards the Eastern Kivu? And they said, well, they being various donors that will remain anonymous for now, they said, well, yes, we just try and sort of ignore some of these issues because really what they're doing in health reform is extremely progressive. So that sort of has a bit of a thing in itself. And this idea of health ministries. In the leadership in saying no to certain demands by donors, international partners, and of course their populations as well. And part of this to me is the increasing need to sell the product. So I work in a British institution, I am British, so anyone who comes to the UK or follows UK health politics will know that the National Health Service is undergoing quite considerable reform. And part of the problem to the uh, government who's trying to push this reform through is that the health ministers have not been successful in selling the product. If the product is flawed, but it is how you sell it. There's a lot of community group leaders who are increasingly seen as solutions to problems of how you get health systems working in decentralized rural contexts. And this is having key dynamic people exhibiting issues. So in this sense, then, leadership in health is nothing new. The stories of health and the books on the World Health Organization and the emergence of global health, these kind of stories or analytical research tends to be populated by certain key individuals. These are just some of the usual suspects that came across. Those suspects that are involved in sort of scientific discovery in the 1800s of the Great Age, and they're those more recent kind of new suspects who've been so influential in terms of agenda setting. Setting is interesting, but you need to necessarily have the cash to do it. You can have a dynamic personality, you can be in the right context. You can build the epistemic communities that are available to you, both internal and outside of the institution. But then, some leaders, such as Bill Gates and Rockefeller, will come down to how much money you have to spend. So it comes down to agenda setting, cash, and of course, discovery. And I thought, well, that's all very well that this is the kind of usual suspects and familiar these stories. What about other sources of leadership? What about the self-appointed leaders of health? This isn't, you know, I'm not going to be a bon asher. People do, but, you know, bon asher is the self appointed savior of a number of health issues. On what basis? My colleague Andrew Cooper says, because he engaged in megaphone diplomacy, you know, his, oh, what do I know? I'm just a rock star, but like, say, the children sort of thing. But some of the sources he has is from individuals such as Jeffrey Sachs. Jeff Sachs, who wasn't necessarily saying anything new when he came came to look at the socioeconomic determinants of health, but said it louder. So they say things, the more it gets on the agenda, the more you're seeing to exhibit leadership. But increasingly, these are individuals that are quite happy to be the appointed leaders of global health. So if I were to see uh, Jeffrey Sachs speak at Chatham House, and he was extremely kind of, I'm saying that he had pretty much put the socioeconomic determinants of health on the agenda of the WHO, and if it wasn't for him, this thing would not be happening. And I've got footage on the Chatham House website that will back up where I'm saying in case he decides to sue me, but hey ho, we'll, we'll live at that. And of course there's the controversial leaders in global health, which are only seen as playing a key role. 
started teaching international relations, it was right at the beginning of the war on terror. And all students wanted to do under, you know, their undergraduate dissertations on is the war on terror legal? You all want to do it. And the same is said, right, so why do you want to do this? Oh, well, you know, George W. Bush, he's just going around like ruining the world, he's evil. I said, aha. Uh -huh. So have you seen what he's doing in the case of HIV and AIDS? Lots of people living around the world with HIV are now being kept alive because of his policy, rightly or wrongly. He has a key leadership role in global health. And then you can see their minds going, no, I can't, I can't get my head around this. Also, there's the role of Supari, the Indonesian health minister. He controversially refused to share virus samples with the HO. Now, some of you may feel that she's not exactly a leader or a hero in the global health world, but other people really identify with the cause that she pushed towards. I don't see her as this irresponsible, controversial figure, or as a one com it was kind of intimated that she was a uh, kind of you know an emotional woman who couldn't control her faculties, which the feminist in some way was just like boring, but we'll get to that. Ask me afterwards and I'll tell you who said it, but I won't say it now. Um, so of course commercial, but it's in saying setting the agenda, changing how we see these kind of perceptions of global health. And then to what the overlooked, also seen as the visionary. Now, Sadiq and Lucas are two names that I've Everyone in this room is familiar with. Both the WHO, all to people in international public policy. I showed this slide to people. Not so many people might know Tapari, but everyone knows everyone else on this slide. Everyone else would know people on this slide. But the bottom of this slide, you don't, don't see this as much. We have visionary influence within global health. For me, effective global health leadership also has to come with communicating to kind of, I was about to say from borders, but I think that's because I was at a hotel with CNN, so I won't say that. Beyond the confines of your domain in this regard. So, I kind of thought, okay, so I can see all these characters, there are these different forms of leadership. How can we actually understand leadership? Well, John, I'm a researcher, I'm going to go to the literature and say, what does the, lead, uh, the literature tell me? The literature told me is the three categories for understanding leadership. These are my own categories, I know they're quite you know, but you know, let's go with it, work in three. First is the big bang concept, which I think is that that is defined we understand leadership in global health. This comes from a very Weberian way of individualized notions of leadership. Charismatic individuals that have a vision, and there's a means in which to mobilize staff and supporters towards that vision. So it's not about institutions, but it's about individuals. And it's a big man. So there are notes on this, it's those great men of history, you know, of the wind, they would somewhere else in the kitchen. It's the big men of history in this regard. So we, again, the feminist in me in this sort of, well, that's a classic way of understanding, thought, well, that's not very good. I'm going to take a step back. So first, we're looking at that great big management of how to get ahead in business and how to lead and how to be extremely successful. And I thought, right, that's fine, but it's still stripping out the politics of these processes. So I found that that wasn't really working for me. And coming from a background in political economy, I started to read all these debates between structure and agency, which basically said you can't have any big leaders in the world because it's the economy is stupid. We're all determined by the neoliberal context in which we operate. So at that point, I was thoroughly depressed. And so, well, this is not the sort of research project that I want to down. But then I will know, because I think there is something that well, Leaders still defined by these demand kind of concepts. The heads of institutions, maybe the states within these institutions, or the holders of the purse strings. So it's still quite individualized rather than institutionally based. And this is often improved by this big management of learning how to lead. Can I ask, this is an audience participating part, how have you been on a management course or a course here in WA on how to be a better leader? You're just being shy. You've never been on a leadership course. Well, I think we know. we'll get this in the conclusion about leadership in WHO. I've been sent on leadership courses just for being director of undergraduate studies. So, okay. Wow. Interesting. I'm going to use that when I write this up. So you can all participate. I've <laughs> been a positive way. So, anyway, and I've still left with these kind of set questions. Well, what is particular about leadership in global health? Health is always a process of changing. So we always need leadership, all these kind of things. And then I went to see Uncle Henry, the Sandra, the most welcome trust. 
And so let's bring together a series of experts from our code of research and global governance, people working in health and working on health issues, and also health historians from medical history to try and work out what they have to say to, about global health and whether this is a kind of fantastic endeavor that I should take forward. And therefore, I'm going to present some of the preliminary findings from this workshop. First is with regard to crisis labor. At the beginning of this talk, I started to say we're in crisis, there are these challenges we need for leadership. But then I started thinking, well, are we in a perpetual state of crisis and constant revolution? Do we all need to be changing? And Stephen Gill, he was actually we're in a different context of organic crisis. Now, Stephen Gill is a very famous political economist uh, from Canada who ran she He thinks so what we're actually in between two historic blocks where the old leaders are still in power, but the new emergent alternative is yet to spring up and kind of replace that. So in this, we're in a form of organic crisis. Actually, no, we aren't. We're in perpetual crisis and that things change and it's not a crisis at all. It's just life and politics that things change and certain ideas are seen as conscious. So this is the changing nature of political life. So the role of leadership is how you deal with these crises and how you deal with these changes. You steer crises to meet your own objectives or ends. For instance, for me, excuse me, leadership is extremely temporal and spatial. It depends on the context in which it works and the time in which it takes place. We can learn a lot from history in global health to identify the idea that institutions such as WHO have always been seen to have uh, challenges to its relevant mandate in global health, as well as the internal actors and just within the institutions. So it's all and it's variable, sorry, and subject to context and time. This brings me to the World Organization. New challenges aren't new. Leadership challenges in terms of internal leadership of individuals and challenges to the institutions. There's nothing new here. But of course, what we see now in WHO is it is a time of change. A time of, I don't know, concern, right? So, a time of concern without worrying you too much, but I'm sure you worried without me saying that. Um, so, but what can we learn and what can we take forward within this regard? And the main issue is the question of whether the WHO has legitimacy but not have authority. WHO has legitimacy because everyone around the world recognizes it as the premier UN global institution for health. But it's not having the authority to communicate the main messages in international public policy circles. Authority is increasingly dispersed amongst agencies such as the World Bank, such as the Berman the Gates Foundation, your Garvey, these new types of institutions. This is not a lead role, or there is a lead role, but it's not being taken by the WHO. Increasingly, authority expressed by those who can show the loudest communicate their messages the most effectively. In this sense, social media has oodles of legitimacy, legitimacy to spare, but lacking in terms of authority. And what's integral is other actors have oodles of authority because they shout the loudest or have the most cash to spend, but are lacking in the legitimacy department. And that they need to force the part. So for me, there's kind of the problem of marketing of the work and the ideas of the WHO. So colleagues and I were talking about the high-profile Dimbleby lectures, which happen in the BBC annually. And Bill Gates was the person who gave the address. What gave the address in the state of global health in the Dimbleby lectures? What Margaret Chan? Is it because everyone's interested because he's Bill Gates and he has this kind of, you know, unfair flow to him? But I don't think that's true. So he has these people interested in it, right? He does not have a job. Um, People are interested in him in the work of his foundation. So you therefore see him doing this high profile work. But he's uh, very effective at communicating the work of the foundation to a global audience in a way that WHO is not. So I'm sorry if people are being interested to hear your take on this. But also, oh, oh Mr. Word off there, there's this problem of effective leadership communicating scientific ideas to policy and for policy to communicate how work works to science. And this is key, it's about social going out and communicating the science, the knowledge that you produce to the outside world in an effective way, as well as internally having a great realization about how these 
policy and the politics of global health work to those people doing the science. And then this is how I see health leadership being related to this issue of communication. And this communication, you actually have new sources of legitimacy and leadership. And McCoy, when he was talking at the workshop, said, well, I really want to know about the Lancet. Rich Horton tweets something, everybody knows about it. Then it published something, everybody's talking about it. This is some research I'm going to start actually looking into more in relation to the Lancet to see what role it has in setting these kind of agenda. And it has this inferred legitimacy that people read it, people trust it. And this is also not just in global health. So in national relations, the study the Lancet did in Iraq had huge impacts on how people were seeing the conflict there. That's what it's effective doing. And of course, the Bender Gates Foundation just know how to spend the all. They don't just have the money. They know how to effectively communicate their work. If I have to read another article in the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Economist, praising this philanthrocapitalism that it's the greatest thing on earth, I'm just going to think. Well, not insane, but maybe insane. <laughs> so in this way, there is this idea of the loud selling of your leadership, selling your position at the centre with some sort of weak form of authority. But also it means that we're overlooking the quiet leaders. Those people who are actually in leadership in various different contexts and pushing forward some forms of health reform. Those people that don't shout the loudest are actually you know, being extremely influential. And someone said to me at this workshop, well, the readers in global health are the ones you don't see. So the kind of idea of leadership that's propagated by some actors, real leaders are the ones that are quietly behind, working behind the scenes. And particularly, there is a silencing of advocates from non-North America and European institutions or having that kind of background as well. And especially you can see this with some Sanjoy's work on smallpox, India, role of the CDC. But I won't give that away because I'm sure this is forthcoming. Okay. To conclude, where does this bring us to? Well, I want to look at what these sources of legitimacy and leadership are and how certain institutions can maximize their collective legitimacy in a way that actually gives them greater authority in global health. A little bit of the differences between leadership and power, which I had in my initial presentation, but I really I'm just going to be talking a lot about A's and B's, and that just might be completely baffling you eating your lunch. Um, as we're looking at the marginalized and quiet spaces of leadership, and I suppose this is part of the reason to have this global health history done, is to explore these kind of marginalized narratives of history, of leadership, to see really if the sort of presentation I've given very narrowly conceived because there's other sources of leadership happening around the world. And I expect that's probably the case. And of course, the art of communicating leadership, and this is something I'm probably going to stop on. Show that obviously is having cuts to its staff, is having questions about its mandate. People are not necessarily listening to what the institution is doing. You have this claim that more leadership needs to be seen. What has to be happening is communicating effectively the work of the WHO beyond the borders of the global health. Right. You need sort of like not a question. One needs to recognise this ability to communicate scientific ideas to policymakers beyond global health. Because if they do it, or if one does do this, then the voice of the WHO will be subsumed by the actors that have authority without the legitimacy, but have effective communication strategies and budgets to do so. So I will thank you very much for listening, um, and I will pass over to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, and we'll get back to asking uh, questions. Um, I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Sanjoy Bataria, who is from the University of York Center for Stable History at the University of York, who is the organizer of these seminars, and um, who will now introduce the who staff. Who, who. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be given these additional responsibilities. This I usually just moderate the questions. Can I? Um, uh, we have three WHO colleagues responding to what Sophie is, has just said. A wonderful, uh, some controversial, but thought-provoking talk, which I salute. Um, um, but first of all, I'd like to invite Dr. Carlos Dora, the coordinator of the Environment and Health 
uh, task. Thank you. I have a slide, Sanjay, if I, just to give us a shot to the, can I? Is it, is the yeah. Is yeah, is there? So we just go here. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> art by. Oh, this is the only one that's have leadership. There's two. Okay. Okay. So, well, thank you much. I mean, it was difficult to, to hear you, and it's very exciting. I'll give a perspective from why I sit in the house. And how is it that we understand global health and and with the perspective that uh, health is about a lot of the health or ill health is created to risks in other sectors, which are not the health sector. Because a lot of the time they are to, to fix it and to sort of perhaps do some secondary prevention, but less so for the primary prevention. And I think it's, it's within that set so that we have been moving in, in the even health department and some other colleagues across the house. So, and the, some of the issues that I see that I'll bring some examples are on, on that limit. And what I see is the, perhaps not only so much in terms of global health as the legitimate uh, leader or sort of um, in uh, health systems and the response to the health system itself. The fact that I see in this uh, phase between the origin of diseases is and where the response can be. And I've yet to respond to that and to identify the right policy uh, space. Uh, it's right at the end. Just one of the put those presentation. It's for leadership. Uh, voila. Okay. I thought I would start saying, uh, starting with that, but I think there is still an issue. I mean, at the EB, it was very telling this year how many countries were for. Um, Terms of health, and how the examples that came from the member states. One of them said, "Well, the best example of I think social the terms of health is the Mercury Convention that we just had this adopted in Geneva. We've got something concrete which is going to happen, and it was going to reduce exposure to mercury." And I thought very telling because how is it that we're concerned about the social determinants? How that we can act upon them? And I, of course, I see that a lot of the History of action with other sectors, which has happened in environmental health. Those who have been to Professor Bishar's presentation here some um, weeks ago, we, I think, and uh, as a good example and a good collection of those case studies, you know, we've done a lot of action in the other sector with major health benefits, but that sort of disappeared in the background. And I think that's one of the things that we have to be able to to, to rescue. I think in terms of understanding the determinants and working with the determinants. And over a bit, um, the mechanisms outside the health sector, which are, they can be tapped if we're going to act on health determinants, notably today on sustainable development goals and, and that kind of debate. But climate change is another uh, example of that. And I'll finish by uh, pointing out some of what I see are our, our, our opportunities today. And do, uh, Make a remark here that the non communicable disease agenda and the health uh, the universal health coverage agendas today have very little in terms of that they determine. I mean, the NCDs has the tobacco, but it's mostly ground that already has been covered. And we're going to be making the connections with the sustainable development activities, with the monies and investments and power and money in society that are going to happen that are happening today on the other areas. So this is. Um, in, you know, um, there's a space that hasn't been yet. I, I'll be no way we understand there's some links. I don't think we have been necessarily able to, to do those. I'll give you some examples of how we've been trying to work around those health and health policies issues in the department. Uh, I'll give you some examples how easy that this has 
uh, come into public policy agendas, the environment health issues. There is environment litigation and the history of, for example, in the U.S., what is the environmental movement? One DRC, which is a um, area which merged environmentalists and lawyers. The environmentalists were doing heavy impact on their own. They got together with lawyers. They proved a few litigation cases which were high profile. They raised the, the agenda very much in the U.S. Another mechanism, and I'm taking examples from the environment, there are clear entry points for health is the host convention, which few of you would know, about access to information, public participation, and access to environmental justice. Now, there's a lot of health issues there. The UNEC convention is being now imported and adopted by uh, the Latin American Convention, and we are being raised in the, maybe that's an opportunity to put health in, but no, there's lots of opportunities there. We've all been working with safeguards of development banks. The development banks especially the regional development banks, but also the private part of, private sector part of the World Bank, ISC, do have work. They seem to like all the impacts of their investments, which are economic, but economic development primarily, on gender, operational health, but also risk community health and safety. Now, I, I don't know if you knew that we there's that opportunity, how many of you have engaged, and this is requirements for the investments which are monitored and assessed and you get your grants or you get your finance in a country or in a private sector in the case of the ISC, you should respond to those criteria. We have developed some guidance for the banks and we've been working mostly with the regional development banks on that, but I think it's a very good opportunity. Another is businesses and, and um, there's a number of codes of practice and social uh, social corporate responsibility, but more important than that, I think there's the Human Rights Commission has now criteria for businesses for human rights. I think that has had more, I mean, although it's recent, that more of an impact in the social issues that and the human rights issues and health and human rights issues can very much part of that. They're not yet there, but you know, that there's, there's this opportunity. Um, then there's the things that we do on our everyday, which is the multilateral conventions. Not only the mercury story, but there's all sorts of chemicals, there's the conventions, there's other things which have a lot to do to contribute public health. We also have into the regional uh, ministry process for environmental health, which for some reason link with our universal health coverage or with NCDs. And I'm taking those two examples because these are the big birth house today. So please. Uh, and I know I've been very uh, superficial. I have s well, the details of what I'm saying, but I, I want more that I can leave you in the, leave it in, in the um, whatever side. I complete with three of what I see as the major opportunities that we could be taking up today to bring that, those are just together. And the one is the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we have the house this thing um, behind universal health coverage. I think that's very legitimate, the healthcare sector, the system is our main reason for WHO to exist, and there's a lot of need for other It's 10% of any um, economy. It's 10% of GDP of any economy in average. So it's a very it's big business. It's activity. We have a lot of responsibility there, so it's very legitimate. But there's also sustainable development goals for energy, for cities, for, for agriculture. And those sustainable development goals carry with them, the potential to really respond to some of the major uh, disease departments. So trying to work around that, and that's work which is ongoing, you know, I'll give you one that I'm spending more of my energies is on energy, partly because whereas I see that there's more interest of the private sector, this is the Secretary General supporting this, very big initiative, very big um, uh, going uh, around that. And the, the question there is how can we use our cloud, our our innovators, our evidence base, and our credibility to bring in that agenda the connection with very specific health goals. Second, and I think there's a number of examples. We have the Global Health Observatory, which is a sort of fantastic open access. A lot of uh, things that we have that we can offer. The second is the evolution. I don't think China is any important today in uh, global health. It doesn't in, in politics and in money, they have a major issue with 
uh, evolution. It's in all the MUFs papers. They have yeah, tau micrograms of cubic meters per um, of PM 2.5. Recently, a couple of weeks ago, and the double trans is, is 20. So really talking about a major, and this is very public, it's visible because there's haze, people and know what it is. Now, we should be using the, that air pollution, the very clear link with health, to engage with climate change because short acting pollutants are very, uh, are the, have the same sources as the this air pollutants. So a very clear connection with climate change with other global agendas. And, um, very clear impact from WHO. We produced the global guidelines. We were set in the standards, the guys more than the women, I'm sorry, but they're having set in the standards. And hurt by these people. I mean, they come and they ask the questions about what, what you should be doing. But I think there, what, where we haven't been, we've been sort of what are the health impacts of climate change. We haven't been, what, uh, what evidence for interventions in, in other sectors that lead to climate change, how much do they improve health? So the research agenda is an action agenda which is important. Uh, the last one is uh, NCDs and universal health coverage. And I think I put the word exuberant evidence. It's so much of it in terms of how is it that a health system could engage with other sectors? What is the unique position of health systems and unique in terms of knowledge, experience, indicators, information systems that can do to, to, to serve those agendas? So I'll close with that, saying that I, I see this the, with other sectors, when the health people and other people have a lot of interest, we have the tools, but we haven't found perhaps the leadership to put together. And I don't know if we're needing is, is uh, an innovation, I don't think it is, or maybe there's a, a lot of agenda setting, but I also think it's to do around coalitions with population, the, 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 the people movement. I think the environment movement has a lot of strength, and the and, and, um, movement has a lot of, so there are conditions which have to be made, which go beyond uh, nation states. Thank you. Delighted uh, to uh, invite uh, Dr. Zafar Mirza, the coordinator of the Department of Public Health, Innovation, and Intellectual Property, to now present the perspective. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> analysts, I am uh, first of all grateful to uh, Sophie for her presentation and uh, this opportunity that we all have to talk about leadership for public health or lead in public health. Um, but begin by saying that uh, in Sophie's talk, uh, she gave me two very important cues uh, on which I would present a couple of slides. It's a very good starting point that she has provided. First, she asked us that uh, what is our concept of leadership and have, have we uh, defined it? Are we uh, a, a good conceptualization of it? And have we actually even invested in trying to define it? Um, and in her patient, she also mentioned of this phenomena of conceptualization about leadership as big men, big economy, and big management kind of uh, stereotypes. Um, she also mentioned that behind the scenes, unsung heroes and heroines uh, uh, in any sector, actually, okay, uh, who continue to contribute, who provide leadership in their own ways, and remain ignored and in uh, unseen. And so I think. Uh, uh, that's why I said that it's a very good cue because for me that is leadership. That is the notion of leadership that needs to be expanded, developed, nurtured, invested in. Um, and he, she asked us action that many of us, this World Health Organization, have actually ended and training any unity in which we solely talk about leadership and uh, we heard the answer. Actually, silence was the answer. Now, 
these are very important perspectives within which I would then start uh, with you of leadership for public health. So that uh, I need to convince anybody that it's ultimately leadership which actually um, um, uh, is made changes. Yeah, or if you look at any big change, uh, small change, you really come to this conclusion that there was some element of leadership somewhere with somebody who actually um, made that uh, difference. All, I think this question of uh, leaders, uh, uh, which comes to us as big people with big authority and, and big ranks and positions, I think this also needs to be revisited. Management um, uh, thinkers, philosophers of century have actually invested hugely in this concept. This whole effort primarily has happened and corporate sector. But investments are made uh, in leadership nurturing. And uh, because they know that the investment has return on investment. Uh, social sectors, the main uh, ignore the area, uh, and not enough attention has been uh, given to it. Uh, Stephen Covey, uh, one of the uh, big thinkers, uh, uh, these issues, he says that leadership first and foremost uh, is attitude, it's human attitude. It's not necessarily is a key or a rank. It's a first and foremost an attitude, and any human being can have that attitude. But crawl to it is that can this attitude be developed? Can it be invested in? And can it be um, um, sort of uh, train people can be trained to have this attitude, and I'll come to that. that. If you get come to public sector in developing uh, word, uh, we talk about any major public health issues, and two people practitioners meet and talk about that issue. The analysis is if they continue, ultimately comes to one point which is responsible for not having that change. And that is, there is lack of political will. Many times, this problem is known, solution is known, is available or can be redirected, and yet that change does not take place. One answer is, is that there is no political will. And would equate that lack of political will to the absence of leadership. But that question comes that what do we do about it? Uh, and public health a, as a sector, as a discipline of uh, development of leadership. Uh, in our health systems thinking, all, all our building blocks, and especially the governance area in, in health systems, in view, have got stalled uh, only to the policy making. There are two buzzwords there. Policy making and uh, management. Uh, really, in health systems thinking, in the whole concept of leadership, um, that the curriculums of public health, learning programs of public health, you do not really find uh, an explicit men of leadership for public health, and development of training materials on public health. We still see the public health professionals as the realm of politicians, heads of the organizations. So, and I uh, uh, make another trajectory to what Sophie said. Leadership in global health is also often confused with the need for leadership for public health. This moment of global uh, public health is providing now uh, essential, basic, fundamental needs for leadership in, in public health which not necessarily are global in nature, which are very local, which are very system oriented, and everybody there uh, need to show leadership to bring that change that we are all interested in. And we actually done a, a systematic literature search and found that there are hardly any literature 
yeah. on leadership, especially coming from developing countries. Uh, sorry, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, materials, training programs, curriculums, uh, accredited programs, leadership in public health, which are available in the uh, hemisphere. Especially in the States of America, which leads in this area, and in Europe, European universities and in Latin American countries. And I must mention Latin America especially because they, they are in the process of, of setting very interesting institutions in public health where leadership is re-emphasized. But yes, for the purposes of this talk, we actually looked at the association of schools of public health and their conceptualization about how public health should, uh, uh, training should be provided. And we looked at the, their um, uh, thinking, their analysis, and their uh, organization of, of uh, thinking about training in public health, especially with reference to, for example, MPH, Masters in Public Health. If you look at uh, the Association of Schools of Public Health in the United States of America, they took five core disciplines, and uh, we are very familiar with them, and I will not read through them. But at the time, to our surprise, when we looked at seven other interdisciplinary cross-cutting competencies that they emphasize a lot, these human informatics, diversity and culture, leadership, professionalism, growth planning, and systems thinking. And leadership then have developed all these areas through groups and networks of professionals. Actually, uh, National Public Health Leadership Development Network uh, in the United States. Uh, actually, over uh, set up early 2000, and they have actually looked at all possible competencies, uh, attributes uh, which can be assigned to the trade uh, for leadership in public health. And uh, there's a very good article on it, actually. Four areas they have actually shortlisted as core competencies which are needed uh, uh, for leadership in public health. Commissional competencies, they call them, political competencies, transorganizational competencies, and team building competencies. And just to give you a, a just a brief it, each of them is actually populated with a lot of and a lot of ideas. For example, in core transformational competencies, there's a really lead concept of leadership, but is many and uh, leadership, sense of mission, effective change, and so on and so forth. And each one, I mean, uh, numbers that you see at the end of each one of the sub components are actually the sub sub level of uh, competencies that they have worked in, on. And they actually, in total, and I have counted 79 attributes and competencies that they have actually listed, which must be part of in public health, which must be part of any uh, development for uh, in public health in any setting. And uh, international organizations, of course, uh, are included in that. And I would also just like to uh, mention that the interest in this area, a uh, few friends uh, uh, got together and looked at it, in a, tried to look at it, this whole phenomenon of absence of investment and, and, and training uh, in leadership of public health, and decided actually to develop an online accredited course uh, on leadership of public health. And actually, there is an interesting um, website for this, nextgenu.org, which actually a new generation or uh, uh, resource, internet-based resources available, which are accredited, which are online, and universities actually provide uh, uh, credits for them. And we are now at this stage, we are in process of selection of those competencies, and then we come up with training materials, readings, uh, uh, videos, series unsung, of unsung heroes and heroines in public health who have made difference uh, in their own settings, in their own ways, Everybody knows about them, and they will never be uh, separated as they should have been.
थैंक यू वेरी मच Finally, uh, Dr. Human Moman, uh, coordinator of Who Press. So I'm sure a lot of people know. So I'll be quite brief because uh, we want to give time also for questions, uh, discussion. Um, out of uh, the WHO staff members that uh, Sophie kindly invited to participate in the health um, workshop that she'd organised last month in London, and thought it'd be interesting to share share an overview of the the work itself, but there were a few, I mean, very good presentations the whole day, but there was a few presentations that I thought would be particularly interesting to highlight for who's staff. Um, they reflect very much on the situation in WHO and the reform process that we're going through. And I um, wanted to select was one made by Anne uh, Emmanuel Byrne, who has been one of the historians that we've invited here uh, to give a, a seminar. And she had a very interesting parallel with the situation that we have in WHO and the reform. We're always talking about how the the field of um, internet health has become very crowded. As you already mentioned, you know, some of the actors now, besides WHO, we've got the World Bank, we've got the Global Fund, we've got um, we have um, Bill and Gates. All these organisations have just become very crowded. And her point was that well, this isn't actually very different. Uh, you know, the idea that there's only one health organization become crowded in the case, if you take this situation 100 years ago, it was just as crowded or not even more crowded uh, because no one had the mandate that WHO had. Because at the beginning of the 20th century, you had a, a national organization, which is the League of Health, uh, League of Nations Health Organization. You had other health organizations. You had the recently created PAHO, the American Health Organization. Organization, which actually pointed out when it was created, actually was created in the State Department. It's also actually in the State Department of the U.S. government, and the U.S. government was very much interested in UH as an influence in international health. Organization International, the EPT, which set up in Paris amongst many European governments, you know, for a long time. That took few years to set up. Of the organization which was also trying to become an international health organization. But they also had um, uh, the old community was also stronger at that time. Um, we had the, um, well, the International Committee Red Cross, which, which was becoming a health organization. There was also the International Federation of the Red Cross Movement, also a powerful NGO, um, with government, government support. The British government was very much uh, supporting that. Um, that Important um, uh, NGOs uh, from uh, echo. Uh, to say the Children Fund, which are politically quite influential. Um, and so she brought out the, the case of a small European NGO in maternal and child health, who, because of the playing off some of these bigger actors, actually had a, a quite an important role in, in that area of public health. And very similar to now, we had a very powerful philanthropy. The Rockefeller Foundation was probably the most important source of finance in public health at that time. So what we have today isn't anything particularly new or complicated. It's what existed a hundred years ago. And that, uh, you know, in fact, the League of, League of National Health Organization was becoming the predominant organization and was cut through, you know, the Second World War and the demise of its organization. Uh, so that was quite an interesting power for us to look at. And then there was another um, interesting presentation by Dr. Theodore Brown from Rochester University, Eastern, which have also invited here, one of the historians that we've had uh, in the presentation. And he brought this idea that, you know, we have the golden age of WHO, and now, unfortunately, we don't have the money, we're suffering political influence, and we're no longer a technical organization. Um, and his point was, in fact, this is a myth. But it was never like this. It has always had financial problems. It's always had some political influences in WHO. Uh, and, um, you know, even super walking out of WHO and all kinds of things. So the idea that you know, there may have been some times when WHO had a little bit of money and sometimes more consensus in the political support. But these are the exceptions. This is not the history of WHO. From its very beginning, um, organization. It hasn't been well funded. 
most of the great successes of WHO uh, were actually at least with very small budgets. So it's not just in that. Um, so, uh, I think it's a kind, of, kind of interesting thing to know that, you know, again, if we look at the current financial situation, WHO, the got, you know, powerful member states who have wanted to take it in this and that direction. This is nothing new. WHO has always uh, worked in that environment. Um, I'm seeing that the time is going on. There's a few others I could talk. Uh, the Spanish have made a very interesting presentation on how the interpretation of the smallpox campaign was actually uh, has changed. It's how history has actually been changed to actually uh, from different times and by different people to support different public policies the perspectives, but I'll let him, if he wants to comment on that later, maybe at question time. And some other uh, very useful um, also presentations comparing governments in other areas such as a migration and refugee and, and, and who global health governance are um, comparing in that field of migration and, and how that's being organized uh, and compared with global health. Uh, I think we'll stop and I'll put over now to Sanjay so that he can um, field some questions that I'm sure people. Thank you, Human. Uh, <coughs> I'm Javan Acharya from the University of York, and if I could request anyone who wants to ask questions, classify themselves for colleagues who are on the webinar system or the WebEx system uh, listening uh, to today's event. So, um, questions, comments? Please, sir. My name is Dave Ray. I used to work for WHO. I'm retired. So obviously, I can only bring in a bit of a historical perspective. The last two years, I was uh, put in charge of a project which had uh, links with something called staff development, which exists. And to use the word leadership and staff development. And we tried hard. This is coming back to the question why there is no leadership, uh, no one has gone through the course. My point was at that time, unless the top management felt a need for leadership development, no one else would fall. And I failed. So we did something in Africa which very much applauded by the then direct, real director, but management people took it over. And they wanted to do much more on task development, performance measurement, and so on, which is, in my mind, not leadership. So I came here, and that was at the era of Brunton. She used to hear about it. So it never took root, and with the departure, the leadership award was completely dropped. We had to develop, coming back to what Sophie has said, through institutions and groups in the Countries. They were in South Africa that I adopted the group, other than the rights in England, which I didn't want to work there. However, we have had a very, very, what should I say, eternal lack of understanding of what it meant, and nearly the majority of the leaders, so called leaders, managers, of which they think they are good leaders and good managers. That's why they are there, and frequently they have no need for leadership. And obviously, they are, you know, those who supervise don't feel that. An example is we have a very, very dynamic leader. Again, uh, I'm going a bit too far, but in terms of uh, history, who all have the marler. Leader, true leader, and I had lots of. Uh, concert with him too, but he uh, he did not call. He at first was against the concept of primary health care. He led into it. Now there was a movement which was all over the world, accepted by governments, accepted by the academia and strongly supported, and on top of that, accepted by the civil society, the NGOs. But soon as he left, it fell this area. I remember I should tell Brooklyn, to at some stage I was close, that why don't you take it up, call it by some other name, but you have a ready-made function. No way she 
he would have the slogan, making a difference. Not many people talk about making a difference, but primary health is still there, although you admit much should have been changed. But don't go into the leadership itself now, because so many people have spoken so much. But I do appreciate very much what Sophie said. Madam. Arms. This is great. Um, my name is Catherine Lawson. I'm an intern. Um, I have a question for Dr. Harmon um, as somebody who's sort of a, an outside view. My question is, do you think that this leadership deficit at the WHO and other IOs that are similar have origins in the way that doctors are trained and the fact that a lot of this organization is medical doctors with that targeted managerial training? throughout their tenure as medical students and then in their professions. Thank you. Also, thanks for speaking. It was great. Well, thank you very much. I mean, those are really very interesting question and really interesting insight. And I think just to respond to um, Debbie's comment is that I absolutely agree with part of my found in doing this kind of leadership stuff try and wrestle leadership away from promoting a certain agenda like this is how you lead to implement performance-based management as opposed to this is how you lead to take the institution where you want. And I think part of that study is to kind of respond to that as well. And my is always the name that's sort of you know, put out there for the successful leader. So um, I'd be interested. I think next time Geneva, I'll take you for coffee at your brain. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Catherine, um, thank you. That's a really interesting point. And I think in a way, yeah. Yes, because in many sort of health systems, effective doctors are then seen to be managers and not only with the training and support of how to manage large teams. And I think in any complex institution, those people that are seen to be competent, well, they don't always become managers, because I've worked with lots of incompetent managers, but they seem to be sort of, okay, well, you're a successful doctor, you seem to have some sort of efficiency, so therefore we should be able to manage without any training. And of course, in WHO, where you have a strong number of clinicians, then that's going to happen. But I think the deficit is much larger in terms of this problem of really how to express authority, how to play the political game. So maybe it's because of doctors, but as clinicians, you've played many political games in your domestic setting. But how to actually work out where are the kind of global policy making dynamics? So it's very interesting your slide on the kind of key competencies and key areas of where you train people in leadership in public health. You know, it's health systems, health systems, there's no politics to it. And see, I would advocate this because this is I have a job, but there is an absence of actually understanding these kind of political processes. I think everyone does understand them, everyone's familiar with them on their day to day. Therefore, when I teach students from sort of clinical backgrounds, they say, oh yeah, we're familiar with this, but we didn't articulate it in certain ways. So, training a sort of leadership that can articulate these kind of political patterns to therefore set some form of authority that combines the interests of an institution, I think, is key beyond this managerial form of leadership. There's political leadership as well. But thank you. I mean, I could just quickly add that. I mean, I mean, field training is great and is to commend it. But first of all, we need a sea change in attitudes where local politics are seem to matter. Yeah. If we're going to steamroll over local political uh, thought processes, uh, only try to sell it, then it doesn't quite work. But uh, understanding variation and politics is very important, sir. So, Mohammed from Global Health Report Alliance. I would like to I mean, comment that it is not the only the individual leadership, it is also the organizational leadership. And we are giving the example of WHO. WHO has the mandate for the the health and uh, giving the policy and actions, but with the time, what we are seeing that globally, uh, I mean, gradually it is going to back. It is strength from the leadership role, and many new players are coming. They are taking the leadership role. There are certain issues. One is if, uh, the we are not uh, coping with the our needs of the global health. That's one of the issues. Second issue: our systems. Maybe our system is very slow to respond to the challenge well in time. 
that is why I mean now even the financial institutions they are coming up with the health programs as the world health program, uh, world bank and others. Other again I mean we have missed a lot of opportunities as Dr. Kass was saying that uh, the lot of scope to work with the other sectors. Uh, as they are responsible for the many determinants of health. We are looking forward towards the WHO and health systems to provide support, but health systems at current level and at global level, regional level, they are not responding to their needs and they are not able to I mean, help them in the respect. So health and development is one of the I mean, no, big, big capital of the world and we must I mean, focus on this issue. Thanks. I, I, I agree with you, and that's part of the problem that when you have actors come into the global health terrain, they say, oh, look, we're not bureaucratic. We can do things quickly without any form of accountability. And I suppose that's my part of the WHO reminding people that it's an accountable, legitimate organization, and that's a unique selling point and a core basis for leadership. So I once went to a talk with Bill Gates Sr., who runs sort of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation with Bill and Melinda. I, said, I asked a question. I said, well, how are you accountable? You call it influence, and how is that influence accountable or legitimate? And he said, well, it's up to Bill and Melinda, and if people don't want the money, they don't have to take our money, and that's the accountability structure. But having that much influence, you have to have this, and I think this is something WHO could push. There's also this question, and it's come up to the Sandra point, about kind of local leadership processes and how leadership is being used instead of ownership, so constructing the right kind of leaders as opposed to leadership being an agency of people being to express and identify their own needs for their country. And again, WHO can have this kind of off-broker role between states and more partners that are often sort of seen in conflict. So if you take performance-based management, the bank is very keen to promote that this is an idea that's coming from sub-Saharan Africa and countries are really demanding it. It was only if I turn off my dictaphone, people in the health ministries will say, of course, that wish. Someone had this idea. They came up with it. They promoted it, and we have to accept it. Where's the leadership there? At least because they are implementing the project how they want them to, or leadership and them say no, which doesn't happen. So it comes back to these issues, and I think the WHO can have this interlocutor role between the sort of state leadership by maximising that and regional offices, and also um, between them and your international partners. So, please. Oh. Uh, hello, my name is Eric Watson. I'm, I'm a volunteer in the HIV de department. Uh, many thanks for the excellent refreshing presentation. I like your style, including the disumor. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, well, I totally agree uh, myself coming from the private sector. Um, I do appreciate that it's, it's very good to, to, to have quality in, in leadership keep all nations fresh and moving forward and working together and gaining synergy. My is take, take, taking into consideration, let's say, the complexity of uh, international, multicultural, diverse UN agency environment, also, uh, there are different leadership styles, so uh, I agree that Causes should take place, but then the next question would be, and what would be the leadership model to be followed? Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you, Eric. I mean, I'm not necessarily advocating the need for these kind of leadership courses. This is very interesting that none of you had been subjected. I say subjected. Had gone on one. Um, because the precise reason I'm not an advocate for them is for the reasons that you say, is it going to be this very corporate management, this is how you lead, and it's a very kind of, I don't know, Western, someone in a business school in Harvard has identified the key factors for how you lead that doesn't actually take into account the richness and diversity of different qualities that people bring. So the question is, how do you reduce complexity into a course, and how do you enhance people's development in a very narrow policy field? And that's not to have a cop-out in response to your question, is something I want to explore further in this big study, to say, well, if you need a diverse structure within an institution like WHO and people have different competencies, and you want to avoid this very prescriptive, this is how you lead, how do you then start to think about leadership and how can it be promoted within these institutions? 
So that's something that I'm going to continue to think about and I'll get back to you once I've worked out what the answer is. But I, I think it's a very important thing to consider going forward as well. Yeah. <laughs> the Management of Substance Abuse Team. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the talk. I, I think about my friends in the NGO, and not the health sector NGOs, and also to a certain extent business who do have discussions at least and go on some of these management courses. The focus for them seems very much on, let's always start with what are values of the organization and what, you know, what values are important for the company and then everything that goes seems to flow from there. I mean, I've never heard these kind of discussions in WHO. Although I think there are large differences between uh, the way the values I think WHO does have, even if it doesn't articulate them, and other health factors, particularly the, the corporate ones. So I'm wondering, uh, do you think, have you any reflections on that? That's all. I think in a way that's part of the concern reform at the moment in WHO. And it's very interesting you say that these conversations aren't actually happening. And I suppose because often when NGOs are established businesses, are set up, you sit down and you say, right, what are the core values that we have under, um, underpinning this? And, you know, everyone always says with WHO, well, let's all go back to ATA and that's what we all get behind. But you would think now within current processes of reform that are happening within WHO that there would be that space to say, okay, what are the core values of this organization? How loosely can they be identified so they kind of fit with the very diverse staff? And maybe then it is time for a kind of that sort of reflection. However, I'm always conscious that you don't want to be in a state of constant revolution. This means that the institution needs to reform itself be a rearticulation of these kind of, you know, everyone says, oh, let's rearticulate our matter. But maybe a kind of beyond that agenda of where are you now? If the global health architecture is proliferating with agencies, which, as Human points out from history, we can see that this has always been the case, but there are different concerns now, and our values are still the same for WHO being relevant and being seen to be relevant, which I think is more important because it's obviously relevant in the contemporary era of global health. But that's really interesting that you're not having these conversations. Maybe other people, maybe other people are having. But also, it's the space, isn't it? I mean, you're all probably doing more for less uh, in many meetings and having to write, you know, many policy reports and have many demands on your time. So, the space in which you can sit down and actually have some sort of philosophical debate about the values of an organisation, of course, is vital. It's all very often for me as an academic coming in, and but you can also say, yeah, but have to get more done with less time, so when am I going to have the space in which to do it? A bold sort of, you know, management that will say, actually, let's have this, have this time. But thank you. Chris was earlier from the middle-income countries. Um, what he was thinking <coughs> is when you talked about leadership in health, if it's a cabinet of ministers in most of the developed countries, they are graduates, have been at least exposed to a university education, though that's not necessarily a sign of this. You look at a cabinet in the low and middle income countries, the majority are not graduates. Now, the question is, you know, I mean, in that sense, some of the ministers that we have are particularly, you know, sort of bring to the ground and do know what the issues in health are, but a majority of them are just politicians who've been there, will in the Ministry of Health for two years and in the next reshuffle will go on to Ministry of whatever it is. I mean, that's how do you, I mean, how do we talk about leadership and so on? I mean, there is at least a structure in the Ministry of Health so the uh, civil servants and the bureaucrats who do that. But can sort of virtually uh, ministers who are not familiar with these health issues and sort of haven't come up. One of the issues that we have faced that if you do go and talk to ministers, a few that I have talked to, how do you start with them to sort of tell them, you know, this is what is health and this is what the priority should be when they have not been exposed to any of this and they have a very limited understanding. So. 
that's one of the issues I see in the low and middle income countries in my area of medicine to try and convince them even so sort of, you know, you get an essential medicine system. And they will say, yes, we want all the medicines. And to say, no, that's not it. We want a limited list. But limited lists are not good. No, we want all the medicines. There is no medicines in the end whatsoever. Right. And um, I think this is a really interesting issue because when I was in Zambia, I was talking to people about how the president wants everybody in a ministerial position to have a degree. And that's extremely problematic when you look at the number of women that are going into universities and coming out of universities. And for me, I really take a point in trying to sort of talk to people at this level that have background in health. But even in developed countries such as the UK, our Minister of Health, Amy Hunt, not have to go full slip, um, necessarily a health expert. He uh, has some expertise, he has some background in health, but he's not necessarily a health ex expert because he's a graduate. And also, someone I really strongly believe in political pluralism, that it doesn't matter if you have had the, well, I shouldn't say this, otherwise my university will kill me. It doesn't matter if you haven't got a university education. You are uh, sort of seeing a pluralist society of diverse different backgrounds and could have a strong leadership role in another way. So you could be a community mobiliser, you could be, you know, quite popular in the abs provincial people. I guess you've not read Hobbes, you know, that means you might not know who's undermining you, who's not undermining you, but you have that kind of practical skill. And then my other point is, is if this is the situation in which, you know, in low and middle income countries that you don't have people that are necessarily trained in health, well, that's the job of the WHO is to support these people and help educate these people. You could say, okay, is that not expanding the mandate increasingly? But I would say, if you want to kind of get the end of the cross of best practice, you're probably better with someone who's new to it than someone who's got their preconceived ideas of how they should be doing health policy. That's my understanding. So, on the one hand, I absolutely take your point. And I think that's a very difficult if that's a start. And I also think it's an important issue of the actual, how quickly the turnover of health ministers. So if you're successful, you're put in, you're reshuffled somewhere else. If there's a corruption scandal, you're the first head to go, even if you're not involved in it. And you're for everything and you have to go to a million and one meeting. But at the same time, I would be very reticent to sort of project this idea that these ministers in some ways have university degrees because political pluralism is paramount and obviously it has gendered consequences. But otherwise, you'd never see any women in the positions at all. You know, you know they're enough and their numbers. It's obviously there are one billion rising today, yay, but not in that respect. I'm Alec Hayese. I come from the Department of Violence and Injury Prevention. Now your, your research is fascinating. I, I just wish to make a suggestion that uh, as you explore this issue in public health, you look at sectors outside that are doing similar research. They work uh, that is going on that has been concerned about change in transport, sustainable transport, sustainable urban development. And one of the issues that is coming out is that uh, we do have levels of influence and we have individuals who bring about change, not so much because of the uniqueness, but they are able to leverage certain issues and they, it's as if they employ several strategies. If when one strategy is over, they go and bring out another one. And some examples uh, people are exploring in this are people like Robert Moses, who was not a leader. He was not a political leader. He never held any public office. But his imprint on the city of New York is still filled up now. And then there's more work that is going on with people like Jamie Lane in Curitiba. He was not really a trans. He was officially worked in the Urban Development Institute, but when you begin to see the level of influence he has in the transport sector and sustainable development that is able to mobilize this. So I like your definition of leadership where you begin to look at influence. Maybe what we need to be exploring is to look at the sectors and begin to ask ourselves, how do we nurture that influence? That we don't necessarily have to do it as technocrats kind of leveraging 
having to. So there are some a couple of studies that uh, you may look at from sectors that may be fascinating to inform your current research. Thank you. No, that's really helpful. Um, so I'll definitely look in these sectors as well because that's really interesting. And I think another thing that might be interesting for us to do is this kind of social mapping of informal networks, which might be impossible. PhD student who used to be an engineer, he's excellent, so I'm going to get him to do it. <laughs> because then that would be interesting to see that how informal networks actually influence certain policy processes. I mean, there was that methodological question of on earth to measure influence, which really, really once asked me. Uh, thanks for that. Don't know. Um, but yes, thank you very much. Sarah. Excellent. I'll look into that further. Well, so that we get more people. 
too many things about. <laughs> do that yeah. next time. <laughs> well, we'll take a that. We'll, we'll practically make our way.